Hi, you guys. Welcome. Welcome. Nada bro pajalovat. My name is Samantha Rogers. Today is Friday, and that means another True Crime Stories with Sal. I'm very happy to be back here in my little bedroom talking to you guys. And today's story is actually first honor killing story type. Uh, I choose to kind of like avoid uh, these type of uh, stories, true crime stories, because I don't know, I have so many uh, opinions about this personally, and it literally I'm a very opinionated person, and I take stuff uh, too hard very easily, and I have a very strong opinion. So, But this case to me uh, was, uh, you know, just stood out, and I wanted to bring some awareness about this case. Of course, all honor killing cases are horrific and disgusting and that they are even happening. And it's literally your own family member that commits this, these crimes. And that's why one of the reasons that I just have a hard time to cover cases like this. But I'm going to try to do my best and be as biased as I can tell this story today for you guys. I don't think I mentioned it. This case is from Sweden. Before I start this case, I do want to quickly do a little disclaimer. And of course, I'm going to talk about murder and uh, honor killing and, uh, you know, a, a brutal, brutal uh, attack, vicious attack that was uh, performed by three individuals. So if this is something that you maybe want to skip today because, you know, I don't know, maybe this is too close to home for you, what have you, please do so. Your well-being is the most important. The names of the people in this story are going to be fictional that I'm going to just, you know, rename them. But the perpetrators are going to be named by their real names. So without any further ado, grab your coffee, grab your tea, grab blanket. Um, let's talk about this case. So the year is 2005 and the month is November and the date is 16th. But before we are going to discuss the tragic event that unfolded on that particular day, I do want to go back and talk about the people that is involved in this case. The family that I will discuss today is a family that is consist with of six people, so four children and two parents, mother Leila and father Rauf. I hope I pronounced it correctly, but I will also mention their names in the description boxes uh, below, just FYI, so you can always Google them. So they had th uh, four children, and the youngest daughter, who I will call Sarah, and a brother that the older one of the oldest brother that Sarah have that I will just go by the brother. Unfortunately, the rest of the siblings in this case are not really mentioned. They are not playing. I don't know if they played a huge role in this case or not. But the two children is Sarah and one of her oldest brother that are most mentioned in this case. The whole family lives in southern Sweden in a small town called Högsby, and the family is originally from Afghanistan. Unfortunately for Sarah, since, since she's the youngest daughter, she, uh, growing up, she had a very, very strict uh, upbringing. You know, her parents, especially her father and her brothers, they basically told her what to wear, what not to wear. She couldn't cut her hair. Her hair was very, very long, and, you know, she couldn't cut her hair. Her family also decides what people she was hanging out with. At no circumstances was she allowed to talk to strangers or boys. She would not allow to have any boyfriends uh, or friends that were boys or what have you. Not go to any school parties or school events. She had to come home straight after school and basically spend her whole day at home. Another thing also that was mentioned that uh, she was not allowed to watch any TV. And if she was watching TV, it was uh, programs that her father was watching. So anything that her father was watching on TV, 
uh, she was allowed to watch, Sarah was allowed to watch, and basically the rest of the family was allowed to watch. And when the father was done, uh, you know, they could not watch any of their shows that they want to watch. This family also had a, another Afghanistan family that they were very close to that lived in Khleftiu. And Khleftiu is a, a town up north in Sweden. So from Hergsby to Khleftiu, it's about a 10 hour drive, I would say. Uh, it take, it's literally like uh, from uh, up north to south. So it's like, you know, uh, a long way. But when they did visit, Sarah was actually loving visiting this family because this family also had a girl that was at the same age as Sarah. So they had a lot of fun together. Finally, you know, she could talk about boys. They could talk about whatever they want to talk about. And, you know, when the parents were doing their own thing and, you know, uh, Sarah and this girl was basically like, you know, doing their own thing. And one time when this family was visiting Sarah's family, her friend introduced her to MSN. And for those people that don't know what MSN is, it's basically like a chat room, uh, online chat room where you chat with your friends, you can add friends or what have you. Kind of like modern day, I would say Snapchat. And one particular guy caught Sarah's attention. He was tall, he had black hair brown eyes, looked very handsome, and a lot of girls, according to Sarah's friend, thought that this guy was handsome. And at that time, he was 19 years old. He was also from Afghanistan. And uh, Sarah's friend kind of like, you know, start, uh, started a conversation with him through MSN, and they were kind of like chatting back and forth. And basically, Sarah's friend introduced them to each other. And I will call this 19-year-old boy or guy at uh, Hassan. So we're going to go, he's going to go by Hassan for the rest of the story. As time moved on, Hassan and Sarah were now frequently talking to each other. They both, uh, Sarah actually um, made her own MSN account and, uh, you know, added Hassan to it. And they were talking to each other every day, uh, mostly during school, because that's when you know, Sarah had a computer or access to computer. She went and used the school's computer, and Hassan went and used uh, the computer at the library where he lived. So they were frequently talking with each other on MSN, and eventually they fell in love. During their conversations uh, via MSN, they were more and more serious about their relationship. They actually start talking marriage, planning like future kids or what have you, where are they going to live. But one thing that Sarah didn't mention to Hassan was that in reality, her family would never allow her to marry him. Not only is it because that she... Um, is the one that chooses who she married. She was not allowed to choose. She was actually already set to marry one of her cousins in Denmark. And this cousin came from a wealthy family. They offered Sarah's family $3,500. So it's like 35,000 krona equals to $3,500 and some gold jewelry for, you know, for Sarah to marry this cousin. So it's already set. Another thing, Hassan came from like a lower rank. So Sarah's family were like a little higher than his family. And usually in, in their religion, you would never ever marry someone that was in a religion that was a lower rank than you. So all of these obstacles didn't stop Sarah from talking to Hassan. And one day she thought that she was uh, home alone or she was home alone. So she decided to call Hassan up on the phone. This was a very rare location, uh, occasion. She would never call him from her house phone. But since, since she was home alone, uh, or so she thought, she decided to call him and they were on the phone chatting and having a great time. And then Sarah's dad and her brother came back home and uh, he, as soon as the dad walked in the uh, door, he could hear S Sarah on the phone chatting and laughing. And the way that she was talking, he understood that it was a boy. And he immediately stormed into her room. And as, when Sarah saw her dad, she panically hung up the phone. And her dad asked her, who were you talking to? Were you talking to a boy? And Sarah was like, oh, no, no, no. It was just a friend from, uh, a girlfriend, a friend from school. 
but the dad didn't believe her, so he grabbed her violently and uh, took her to the bathroom and ordered her, uh, his son, Sarah's brother, older brother, to grab a knife from the kitchen and bring it to the bathroom. And while Sarah was there with the dad, dad were very violent towards her. I don't know if he beat her up, I'm assuming. He basically demanded to know who she was talking to because he was convinced it was a boy. What, what boy was this? Where did he meet this boy? Who was he? And all of that. And when this brother came in to the bathroom with the kitchen knife, he ordered the brother to basically stab Sarah. And he said that, I'd rather kill you right here and uh, right here on the spot than you bringing shame to our family. Luckily, the brother didn't do as the dad told him to do. He couldn't stab his own sister. He refused. So the dad basically just, you know, kind of like, let that be a warning for you, basically, to Sarah. And at this point, Sarah realized that her family were never, ever going to let her marry Hassan or ever, you know, have her um, choose her own life. So at that point, she decided to run away. She contacted Hassan and told her about this whole ordeal. And she said that you need to take me away from this family, from this house. I want to be with you or I will commit suicide. Hassan had no choice. He loved Sarah and he did as she said. And he actually took that um, a train ride, a 10-hour train ride from Khileftio to, to Hergsby, and they met up at school uh, on a Thursday afternoon. So after school, Sarah already had her bags uh, packed or whatever she could bring, she brought. She also changed all of her password to MSN, to all her emails, what have you, so no one could hack or know where she was or who she was staying at. So after school, uh, they met up and they uh, took the train back to Khileftio. Once arriving to Khileftio, Hassan and Sarah stayed at Hassan's apartment where he also shared with his one of his roommates who was also a boy from Afghanistan. And Sarah immediately cut her hair shorter, not super short, but shorter because I remember I told you in the beginning her hair was extremely, extremely long. She took off uh, her shawl that she was wearing and she basically started living uh, the life that she wanted to. And her, um, her and Hassan was finally able to be free, walk on the street, holding hands, and, you know, just be like a normal, regular couple. Back home, uh, Sarah's parents start to get worried and they, because, you know, she was not coming home and they were... Uh, not understanding as what what could have possibly got into Sarah, where could she possibly go. At some point, they even thought that the cousin from Denmark had something to do with it, that he basically kind of like, she went over there to him and he couldn't wait to marry her and that she was with him. But when they contacted the cousin from Denmark, the cousin from Denmark said that Sarah was not here. He didn't bring her to Denmark and that he hadn't spoke with her in a while, but the cousin actually said that he know uh, or that he saw Sarah talking to a guy from Khileftio on MSN. And the family put all the pieces together and they realized that, aha, uh -huh, okay, so Sarah has to be in Khileftio. So the mother, Leila, Sarah's mother, contacted other Afghanistanian uh, family, friends, or what have you, that lived in Khileftio to see if they maybe spotted her daughter in town or what have you. And some people actually said, yeah, we actually seen Sarah. Uh, she kind of changed her appearance, but she, I think it's her. She's been walking around with a guy and, you know, what have you. And immediately the mom and the brother took the first train up to Khileftio. Once arriving to Khileftio, Sarah's mother uh, asked around where usually like uh, young Afghanistanian guys uh, were staying at, if it was like some apartment building, what have you, and she actually got a few addresses. So she basically 
start to start with the list and go visit an apartment by that list to see if Sarah was staying there. According to the witnesses, to the guys that Sarah's mother visited, she basically stormed into the apartment demanding to speak with Hassan and a one witness even claimed that she was screaming, I'm going to kill Hassan, he kidnapped my daughter, he deserves to die, where is Sarah? She was very panicked, very angry, and the witnesses said that, uh, you know, they could not even calm her down. She was literally furious. One of the guys that Sarah's mother visited at actually knew Hassan, and he knew that Sarah was staying there. So he, as soon as the mother left, he contacted Hassan and said, hey, you know what, Sarah's mother is in town, and she's basically visiting all the apartments that you know, uh, young Afghanistanian guys live at, and I think she might visit your apartment soon, so just FYI, uh, you know, she's very, very angry. As soon as Hassan and Sarah found this out, they panicked. They basically cleaned up the whole apartment, got rid of all of, like, girly stuff, makeup, clothes, hair items, whatever, and basically um, they had Sarah hide in the laundry room downstairs in the basement of the apartment. And as soon as they did that, Sarah's mother and brother star stormed into Hassan's and his roommate's apartment. And again, she, you know, demanded to see Sarah and that she knew that Hassan had her and that he kidnapped her. He, he, she called him a kidnapper, what have you. And then she basically took Hassan's phone without permission and started go going over the phone to see if she could find possible text messages between both Sarah and Hassan, but unfortunately there was nothing there. And then she went into the kitchen and at this, on the stove she could see a pot brewing and it was a pot of, with food. And uh, she opened the lid of the pot and she could see that it was a, a food um, that Sarah used to cook at their house. And the smell and the consistency of all of that was the exact same recipe that Sarah was known in her family to cook that food and Sarah's mother knew that it was not Hassan and his roommate that was possibly cooking this dinner for themselves. So after a few minutes of arguing and demanding to see Sarah, uh, Hassan's roommate actually called the police. The police arrived and, you know, they had to escort the mother and the brother uh, out of the apartment. Sarah's mother and Sarah's brother had no choice but to leave Khleftiu and go back to Hugsby. After that incident, it was far from over for Hassan and Sarah. They received multiple threat, threatening calls from Sarah's mother, from Sarah's family friends, that they are going to basically kill Hassan, that, you know, they're going to send people over to hurt him, or what have you. Sarah's mother was saying that she has friend in Khleftiu that would basically stalk them and once they found out that they're together they're gonna come into the apartment and hurt Hassan and what have you. So Hassan and Sarah was very very frightened of this so they basically stayed low for weeks. They barely went out unless it was nighttime, unless it was dark out they went out to maybe do some quick grocery shopping, what have you, but for the most part, they stay inside the apartment. After a few weeks, Sarah and Hassan decide that something has to be done. This is not a life to live like this, and they, you know, they don't want to be on the run no more. So they actually contacted the social services in Khleftiu, and all the social services told Sarah was that, I think you, you should go back to your family, talk to them, and you know, kind of smoothing things out and what have you. They didn't understand the severity of the situation, that Sarah was actually, you know, she was risking her own life if she was going back there to her family because at this point she betrayed, she dishonored her family by, you know, running away and living with a boy that she is not married to. What Sarah and Hassan decided to do after the conversation with the social worker was to have Sarah call her mom or call her family herself and try to smooth things out with them on the phone, trying to explain that, you know, she really loved Hassan, she want to marry him, and this is her 
future husband and that she just wants the family blessings. So that's exactly what Sarah did. She borrowed a phone from one of Hassan's friends and she called her family. And as soon as she called her family, her mom uh, answered the phone and when she heard Sarah's voice, she was extremely overjoyed and happy that she finally, you know, spoke to her daughter. And during this conversation, Sarah's mother said, you know what, Sarah, I actually talked to your dad and I told him the whole situation. I understand you love Hassan and your dad actually agreed to, you know, bless you guys to allow you to marry. And I want you to come here and bring Hassan with you. And we're going to throw you a proper engagement party with good food with friends celebration and just celebrate your love and bless blessing like give you a blessing that we are okay with your love and that you guys can marry each other upon hearing this sarah was extremely overjoyed and she agreed to do so uh, but on one condition just in case because this also sounded too good to be true so just in case she just want to bring a social worker to kind of like be present when the families are meeting or when Hassan and Sarah return to her family. So it's no uh, arguments, nothing bad going to happen. It's just going to be, you know, smooth uh, talk or have you. Um, and kind of like a peace talk or, yeah. And uh, Sarah's mother agreed. So they decided to, on a date, uh, November 16th, that's the date that they kind of come back home. Uh, back to Sarah's family and that's the date that they're going to throw them a kind of like a little a welcome home sla slash engagement party. But even though all of this, Hassan was not convinced. He had, his gut feeling was telling him something was up, something was wrong. And before leaving to go visit Sarah's family, he actually told his roommate that if you don't hear nothing from me in three days, you need to contact the police because then something has happened to either me, Sarah, or both of us. Upon arriving to Hergsby, Sarah and Hassan was met by Sarah's mother at the train station together with a social worker. They both sat in the car and drove off to go see Sarah, rest of Sarah's family. And during the ride, Sarah was kind of like glancing at her mother. She was sitting in the passenger side in the front, and Hassan and uh, Sarah was sitting in the back. She, the mother never acknowledged Hassan. She never said hi to him. She never even looked at him. She had her head down, and Sarah could see that she was crying all the way to the house. Upon arriving to the family's apartment, Sarah, Hassan, social worker, and Sarah's mother walked in, and as soon as they walked in, the whole vibe, the whole energy was weird. Like, the siblings were not happy to see Sarah. Sarah's dad was not welcoming. He was actually, he looked furious. He looked angry. There was no celebrationing, like, no good food that was promised. There were no guests that, that were invited. Instead, they, the family got some dog treats, and they had some dog treats on the table. And according to the Muslim religion, unfortunately, dogs are, you know, not um, looked at as like a respected animal. So basically, that's what they saw uh, at this relationship between Sarah and Hassan. They were kind of like dogs to them. So the social worker, he didn't stay for long. He just kind of like, you know, saw that everything looked okay, even though, you know, the vibe were kind of off. But he just said, okay, you guys, I'm going to leave you here. Uh, make sure, you know, don't, you know, have a good time. Try to talk to each other, civilized. If anything, just call me. But, you know, like try to, you know, have fun. As soon as the social worker left, Sarah's mother and father took Sarah to another room and basically told her and Hassan that they wanted to speak to Sarah first in private. And Hassan was uh, actually escorted to another room where he had to sit there and wait till Sarah and her mother and father were talking and then they would talk to him as well. While in this room, Sarah was served a uh, orange juice, and first she kind of like didn't want to drink orange juice. It was kind of random, but she, you know, she didn't want to be rude to her family, so she kind of like, you know, took some sips and 
drank this orange juice. And after a while, she started feeling dizzy and very, very tired. So she lay down on the bed and fell asleep. Three days passed since Hassan's roommate have heard any words from Hassan nor Sarah. So as Hassan told his roommate that if you don't hear nothing from me nor Sarah, please contact the authorities because then something has happened to me or her or both of us. And that's exactly what Hassan's roommate did. He actually called the police and he told what, you know, his suspicion that he hasn't heard from Hassan in days. I think it went four or five days. Actually, he gave them extra days. But he's now very, very worried. And last thing um, he, you know, spoke to his friend or roommate was when they were leaving to go to see Sarah's family in Hugsby. But it's been five days now and he hasn't heard nothing. So police do a welfare check uh, and they discover the inside of Sarah's family's uh, apartment home. They discovered Hassan's dead body. His body was in very, very horrific state. Half of his skull were missing. He had several burn marks on his, mostly on his face, but also on his body. He had his jaw broken, and most of his teeth were broken, like half or off completely or what have you. He was missing teeth, and some teeth were broken. Indicated that it was some sort of force that was like basically broke his teeth with some blunt force object and you know uh, broke his jaw by forced opening his mouth. He also had severe stab wounds all over his body. Next to Hassan's dead body was a kind of like a machete knife. Uh, uh, laying there next to his body and also a camera and upon reviewing this camera they found some disturbing images of this young man holding this machete looking knife and posing with it and this man was no other than Sarah's older brother. The whole apartment was completely cleaned out. There were no uh, no clothes left, no uh, uh, items, nothing. The whole family was basically MIA. They cleaned up the house and just left. And since the whole family was MIA, police immediately put out a search for Sarah and her family. And luckily, they actually found them a few days later in Denmark. They were the whole family actually went to that cousin that Sarah was supposed to marry in Denmark and they stayed low at their house. Sarah and uh, her brother and her mother and father were all arrested. And upon interviewing Sarah, they quickly, the police quickly realized that she was actually a victim herself and that she had nothing to do with this. So they let Sarah go. And they actually gave her a new identity, completely new identity, because they figured out that, you know, she was in great danger. She was also a victim and possibly could be murdered by her own family. So till this day, she lives under, a, you know, new name, new identity in a new town in Sweden. After interviewing the mother, the father, and Sarah's um, brother, Sarah's brother actually confessed and he said that it was him uh, that killed Hassan, but he killed him in self-defense. And he basically said that when Sarah and her mother went into the room to talk, uh, Hassan was ordered to sit there, uh, or the brother was ordered to sit there with Hassan and kind of like small talk with him or what have you until Sarah was done in the other room talking to the mom. And during this time, uh, Sarah's dad went to the bathroom and uh, when he came out, he basically saw his own son and Hassan like struggling, fighting. And at some point, you know, his son was kind of like overpowered by Hassan. And according to the dad, Hassan was very strong and he kind of like, you know, pushed him off. He couldn't help his own son off, but his son, so Sarah's brother, 
and then kind of overpowered Hassan at one point, and he starts stabbing him with that knife. And the argument was about Sarah, of course, that according to the brother, Hassan was very kind of like nonchalant and very rude, uh, despite that, you know, according to the family, he kidnapped their daughter, their sister, and he's not even sorry about it. And uh, so the brother basically kind of like took it as a disrespect and Hassan was very rude and they start fighting about that. Despite this confession, police still felt like uh, he, he couldn't be the only one that did this to Hassan because not only uh, do the you know evidence point out that it was a ta like a vicious vicious attack, not just like a self defense stabbing, like like I mentioned, like his whole face was barely unrecognizable. He was missing part of his skull. His teeth were missing. It was a brutal attack, and police knew that this could not just have been uh, performed by a young teenage boy. But since it, and they had a confession, they had no other choice than, you know, arrest Sarah's brother and give him four years in a youth detention center or youth prison. I don't know exactly how to translate it from Swedish to English, but it's basically, basically a prison for the youth. So he was under 18 and, uh, yeah, he was considered a minor at that time. And he only got four years in that prison. And after those four years, he would be deported back to Afghanistan. And he would basically be banned from ever coming to Sweden. During this four years, uh, the brother, Sarah's brother, had a lot of thinking to do. And I guess, you know, at some point uh, he realized that, you know, it's best for his own sake, uh, for his own well-being to come clean. Not only was he afraid of being deported, but he was knew also that back in Afghanistan, Hassan's family and friends were waiting for him to come and they would probably take their revenge on him. And also, he actually never lived in Afghanistan by himself. I do think he might have been born in Sweden. I'm not 100% sure. Or he came like very young age, so he barely know anyone in Afghanistan. He doesn't have like any like close relatives, I believe. So it would be like a huge change. And also he's basically afraid for his life to, you know, be murdered there by Hassan's family. So after the four years, uh, Sarah's brother decided to finally come clean and tell the actual story or the actual events that took place on that fateful night of November 16th of 2005. So as soon as Sarah and Hassan arrived to the apartment and as soon as the social worker left, they took uh, the mom and dad, they took Sarah into the other bedroom and they gave her that orange juice, but the orange juice were laced with sleeping pills. And that's why she kind of like dozed off, fell asleep right away. As soon as she was knocked out in that other bedroom, they went into Hassan's bedroom and uh, before they went in there, the mother actually prepared a pot with boiling hot grease or like cooking oil. And whenever the door opened to that bedroom where Hassan was sitting waiting for the family, she basically threw that hot oil into onto Hassan's face. And in excruciating pain and shock, Hassan stood up, started screaming and, you know, wanted to leave the apartment, but the dad and the brother dragged him back again and, you know, start to viciously attack him. The dad had a baseball bat and he started beating uh, Hassan with it, uh, mostly on his face uh, and on his body, wherever he basically could uh, beat, but he was aiming for Hassan's head and face. During that beating, Hassan's, uh, or Sarah's mother went back to the kitchen and she prepared some more uh, grease, some more cooking oil. Uh, and this time when she came back, they forced Hassan's now beat up body. He's still alive though, but, you know, bleeding profusely from all his wounds. They forced his mouth open with like a plier. I don't really know what it's called in English, but yeah, a plier, whatever, metal 
forced open his mouth so the mother can pour that hot grease into his mouth. And uh, while they were doing that, that's when the teeth was breaking and all of that jaw were break, broke, broke during that attack. But Hassan was still alive. And at this point, the dad ordered his son, so Sarah's uh, older brother, to grab that machete-looking knife that he was later posing with on the camera. Or that, I don't know if that photo was taking that knife or previous, but the same knife that he was posing in that picture he grabbed it, but according to the brother, he had he didn't have the balls to do it. He was too afraid. He didn't want to kill him. He knew that if he starts stabbing him, then he would definitely be dead because, again, Hassan was still alive, uh, even though he went through horrific, horrific torture from before and now basically burning from inside. Um, he couldn't do it so the dad grabbed the knife and he started viciously stabbing Hassan all over his body and eventually Hassan succumbed to his injuries. After the attack was done they clean, uh, quickly cleaned up they took whatever they needed you know clothing items uh, other items whatever whatever was necessary to take the rest they just left and the whole family fled to Denmark to hide. Now, I don't know, I couldn't really find what Sarah, like how Sarah, I'm sure she was in great shock and, you know, just scared and traumatized. I'm sure they told what happened to Hassan. I don't know if she ever saw his body. I don't know if she got beating. I'm assuming she probably did. But it was not mentioned, so, you know, just say, I, I know, I'm, I want to know, like, how, how did she react or how did they tell her? But unfortunately, I couldn't find that information. While the whole family was in Denmark hiding, they decided uh, on this plan that when they get caught or if they get caught, that the brothers should come clean and blame everything on him because he is under 18. He's still a young, uh, he's considered... Uh, not adult yet, so he would get a linear sentence instead of telling the whole truth and kind of like, you know, have the fam and have the parents confess because they for sure would get longer sentence and what have you. So that was basically the plan and that was why um, the brother basically confessed and just uh, told that story that he and Hassan, uh, you know, start arguing and because he felt disrespected that Hassan took his younger sister away from him. Sarah's mother, Leila, and father, Rauf, uh, was arrested, and they got life in prison, but life in prison in Sweden is a um, minimum of 10 years, 10 to 15 years. So they got 10 years in prison, and after that, they would be permanently banned forever, ever coming to Sweden so they would be deported for life. I don't know if Sarah and her brother have contact with each other. I know that both of them live under um, different identities and in different cities in Sweden and I know that Sarah's brother married a woman and uh, yeah but he again he lives under another identity and name and so does she. I'm not going to say my opinion because I feel very strongly about cases like this, especially being half, uh, uh, my dad is Middle Eastern, so luckily I never ever had to experience uh, such, uh, you know, such things uh, in my childhood or what have you, or the environment or my family uh, are luckily don't think that way, you know, um, but I know that honor killings are a thing and happens too many times and too unfortunate and young innocent people loses their life because of some beliefs you know so that's what I'm gonna say about this please stay respectful as you would do if you were talking to a family member or your grandma well my darlings that is it and if you do have any case suggestions please let me know in the comments below I always read my comments and if you do like content like this, don't feel free to share this video, uh, like, and of course, subscribe. That would help my channel out so much. All the love that I could get, I would really, really appreciate it. Till next time, my sweeties, stay safe, stay positive, 
stay happy and healthy. And I see you guys next Friday. Ciao, cacao.